Bases dropped on a wall past Wednesday here on Soccer's Morning Show. John, hear you there. Full show as always. And uh, let's we'll go backward a little bit before we go forward and opening kickoff and get you ready for later this morning. And then we'll get you ready for everything else going on today. And we'll we'll lay it all out for you and let you know that uh, it, it's a busy time. It, it is a busy time with playoffs and such and, and everything all over the place. But uh, tonight, 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 morning, Dell. Uh, it is 7 o'clock pregame, 7.30 kick. MLS Next Pro here on the SDH Network. It is Chattanooga FC as we await for a Derby name. And this is where I think Jarrett will come into play. And maybe Tyler Pilgrim coming up in just a little bit. What do we name the Derby between Chattanooga FC and Atlanta United 2? It's at the fraction tonight. And it is kickoff a little after 7.30. It'll be me, Jarrett, and Maddie uh, hanging out with you in Kennesaw. So looking forward to that one. And seeing how uh, Atlanta United 2 responds after uh, two... Uh, very, very deep losses in uh, the sense that they've were out, been outscored 9-1 in their last two games. How do they respond to this one? They've got another opportunity to uh, flush but not forget and see how the lessons come tonight against uh, Rod Underwood and Chattanooga FC. Once again, 7 o'clock pregame, 7.33 kick with, uh, me, Mar- with me, Maddie, and Jared on the network here at uh, Soccer Down Here. And you can go to our Mixler site, and you can – Catch all of our action there, all of our live stuff. Download the Mixler app, M-I-X-L-R, and you can get all of our live content. You set your notifications. You follow soccer down here. When we've got a game going on, then you'll know about it. Uh, If you want to access it through uh, web browsers, right there, soccerdownhere.mixler.com, and you can listen on the web. You can sit at your computer and do whatever you want to do at uh, 7 7 o'clock at night, tonight anyway. And you can listen to us that way. So web, soccerdownhere.mixler.com. If you believe in downloading apps and have enough space on your phone, download the Mixler app. And then you can follow Soccer Down Here. And then we have when we have a live event, then you can just click on it and listen to it through the uh, Mixler app. And thanks to everybody who was uh, part of what happened last night. Last night, it was a Tuesday night playoff throwdown on the SDH network. In 7A Girls, it was uh, Mill Creek and North Gwinnett at Tom Robinson Memorial Stadium. It went for a while. It was a fun one. I mean, it was a hot and it was a hot crowd, and you love that because you have two schools and coaching staffs that are intertwined throughout Gwinnett County and their histories, two schools where they know each other, and you know they, you hang out in you hang out in academy, you hang out in club, you hang out with each other when you're not in school, and you get a lot of support from both student bodies and from a lot of parents as well. And it, it went uh, for 120 minutes, or went for 100 minutes. And you ended up in the, oh, what, 116th minute? It's uh, our moment to uh, get you ready for what's going on here today in the playoffs. It was 1-1 until it wasn't. Here was the eventual game winner, courtesy of uh, Jason's voice on the network late last night. Defender, but the Hawks are able to run it down and clear. Varley settles it, plays it down the middle. Issa Ponza heads it forward. Stokely goes down. Here comes North Gwinnett. Furry is out for it. Does it win it? Shots into the back of the net. Goal, 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 North Gwinnett. On a scramble as it ended up falling forward. Mill Creek valiantly tried to find a way to clear it. They were unable to do so. Furry came out to try to get to it. But Wesley Istone Hout is able to put it into the back of the net. Not the prettiest of goals, but if it gets the Bulldogs to the quarterfinal, it'll be the most beautiful goal of their season. Wesley Stone hopped with her 12th of the year in the 100 or the what 90, let's see what, uh, 16 plus uh, 96 minute. And uh, she ends up with the eventual game winner. So great crowd last night. Thanks to everybody who was listening. Thanks to uh, uh, everybody that was a part of it. And uh, thanks to uh, the North Gwinnett coaching staff for uh, hanging out with us. And uh, Ryan Burkhart got to uh, 
uh, hang on, hang out with uh, Jason on Atlanta Soccer tonight. You can listen to that interview on the Off the Woodwork podcast. Go to 92.9 The Game. Go to podcast Off the Woodwork Atlanta Soccer tonight. And uh, 20 minutes in, you get to listen to uh, Jason hanging out with Ryan Burkhart. And thanks to everybody there at, uh, at North Gwinnett, AD Matt, uh, AD Matt Champito, and all the coaches and everybody, both teams. Uh, we had both uh, starting coaches uh, on yesterday on Soccer's in Session. And it was great to catch up with Vince Hayes and Ryan Burkhart and everybody for both of those teams at noon on the network. It'll be a soccer's in session day two, round two, and we'll get you ready for tonight. We'll have a bit of a tease, hopefully, coming up uh, later in hour number two here on the show. But, yeah, we'll go over all the brackets, all the results, get you ready for today. There were some matches that didn't happen last night, and we'll get you ready with the schedule for today. So it'll be a it'll be a fun one for uh uh, all of us coming up at noon, uh, I think we're going to finally get to be able to catch up with Phil Thomas from River Ridge, Chris Leone, as they get ready for their trip uh, on the boys' side for North Gwinnett. So River Ridge and North Gwinnett get us started in soccer's in session coming up at uh, coming up at noon here uh, on the network. Okay, that was opening kickoff, brought to us by our friends at uh, Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. And there is your QR code for those of you who are watching, however you're watching us, whether it is on uh, Twitch. It is on the 280 character app. It is on our YouTubes. You can uh, click on that QR code, start your day with kickoff coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. You hit that QR code, you check out, you use the code soccer down here 15. You, use, you get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10%, reinvest it into youth games, youth initiatives, stuff that uh, they have earmarked as cool. Just ask Melissa Ortiz because she is one of the co founders. That reminds me, I need to put something in the mail for Melissa Ortiz and uh, have her hang it in her office in New York. So uh, soccer down here, 15 is your code. You get 15% off uh, and uh, kickoff coffee takes 10%, reinvests it in the youth games, youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at kickoff coffee and at kickoffcoffeeco.com. Uh, just so you know, it is uh, May the 1st, according to uh, uh, Jonathan Tannenwald et al., as they say in Latin, and uh, Michelle Kaufman as well. Michelle Kaufman says Copa America finals tickets go on sale May 1st, May 1st, and you can set your bank accounts accordingly. So, uh, and apparently Reggie, Reggie Bush is going to have his uh, 2005 Heisman Award reinstated. So, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year for those of you who are celebrating from uh, the University of Southern California. So, uh, mazel tov to you. All right, it is uh, 9.13. I'll round off. Since we got past 9.12.30 on the clock, I'll round off. So, you know, you get you get past two and a half, you get to round up to five. That's how we grade here on the show. And so uh, it is a wall pass Wednesday. And our leadoff hitter on wall pass Wednesday is, as always, Tyler Pilgrim from uh, our friends over at Scarves and Spikes. Scarves and Spikes. See, and I have to do it in the mirror. So it's like N Spikes and hope that I get it right. I don't know how you do an N with your fingers. And uh, yeah. Well, because if, if I'm doing if I if I'm looking at it and I'm doing it toward me, it's like this, and so it's like okay, so I have to do it in reverse. So yeah, this way toward me, and then this way the other way toward y'all. It's fair enough. Uh, all right. So first and foremost, the most important question of the segment: what? Uh, where's the mug and what's in it? Um. So no surprises. I'm doing the the scarves and spikes one again. Okay. Um. I was going to do the great there wolf will lodge be one. a plug. I'm sure at some point as there should be, <laughs> you know, I was, I, you know, we went to the great wolf lodge this weekend and uh, I didn't get a new mug there, but I have the one that I have shared on the show before. Okay. And, uh, I just was too lazy to grab that one this morning, <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's, it's all about proximity. And, uh, the thing is, if it is, if it's see, we're as, as, uh, as guys, you know, uh, I will present as my evidence uh, this particular plastic cup. Yeah. And it comes from a kickoff classic at the, okay, so it doesn't even, oh, it's, yeah, it does. It lists the venue. I see so, August 31st of some year on there, too. Correct. And the, the <laughs> venue is listed as Georgia Dome. So you know how Ooh. old this cup is. And, and, you know, as a guy, we're just like, you know, uh, is anybody else touching it? No, no, it's, it's our germs. I mean, it's just, it's like, look, <laughs> it's, I've touched it. No one else is touching it. No one else is going to, you know, experience what I've experienced in this cup slash mug uh, slash drinking container. So if it's okay for me, 
it's still going to be okay for me later. Yeah. And, and so as long as no one else touches it, then then everything's fine. You you don't get any of my you don't get any of my cooties. You don't get any of my germs. None of that happens to you as long as you don't touch nothing. And it's it literally, I mean, it's like guys with all of their stuff, you know? It's yeah. If if that repository of choice liquid mm-hmm. was good yesterday, yeah, it's good today. This is what I'm saying. So this <laughs> this is this is where this is where we are wired here as a part yeah. of all of this stuff. Um I know that uh, there was a, a story that is out now on the website. I believe that's what the kids call it, is a website. Yes. And uh, there was some work that was done by the uh, the SNS crew about someone who puts butter in their coffee. <laughs> and, yep. and so you guys had the chance to catch up with uh, Javier Armas uh, over at, with, uh, with the twos. And, you know, your, your timing, once again, kismet, considering Chattanooga FC is coming to town tonight. Uh, some would think that that might even be planning. What was it like for the, the SNS guys to catch up with someone who is growing into his role there with Atlanta United to, and has shown the, the three dimensional thought that is needed at times for the positions that he plays. Um, so I think, you know, with, with Javi, first of all, he's, he's just a pleasant guy, you know, like soccer, notwithstanding, like he, he's a nice guy. He's genuinely like happy to be a part of this organization. And, you know, Henry was the one shout out to Henry Higita. Um, he's the one that actually did the interview and wrote the article. Um, but one of the things that Javi kept bringing up was he's living his dream. This is what he's wanted since he was a kid. And, you know, I think you saw a lot of it in the preseason and it took people by surprise. Like he, he's a talented footballer. He really is. Mm -hmm. Uh, He has that Spanish, like very fundamental Spanish kind of flair to him. uh, Both I think like personally and in his soccer. (laughs) Yes. Um, But yeah, I mean, he, he, I think he plays at an IQ level above probably what you would expect coming out of college, but he spent so much time with the, you know, La Coruña Academy and like he, he, it was a good group that he grew up playing with. And so, um, I only got to talk to him for a short bit of time yesterday when they did the interview because I had to go, but it was nice being able to meet him. And again, just a super like personable, nice guy. And like, you can tell knows the game, but is just like, it's not lost on him that he needs to live in the moment because he's now where he's been wanting to be for his entire life. Mm-hmm. And it's really and, cool to see. Yeah. And when you get to see, and, and well, and Hey, you know, he, he got to escape the Tupac. Uh, which is what is left of the Pac-10, 12, 14, yep. however many it's left. So, yep. uh, you know, from his time out West, he comes here. And to men- to to your point about what we saw in the preseason, it's like, okay, where did, where did he pull that move from? You yeah. Know? And, and you're, you're just sitting there going, okay, dude's a, dude's a, dude's a warlock, man. And there are times where you're just sitting there going, whoa, we got it. We got to see what else is going on with Javi Armas. And is he, he can take, well, I think the thing that stood out to me first, when I first saw him play, um, I don't know if he played in Birmingham. I can't remember, but I know he played in Athens and I remember in Athens, it stood out to me that he was immediately when he came on the first choice to take free kicks mm-hmm. and corner kicks mm-hmm. and how good he is at them. And I mean, he's already scored one this year with the twos. I think it's one. It might've been two. I don't think, I don't know, but sounds, I know he scored. Yeah. It's either way. Um, But I mean, he's just, he's talented, right? He's, he's, he's got uh, a little bit of flair to him. Mm -hmm. He's tricky, but he's that midfielder that has the attitude that you want, right. To kind of help lay down the law when need be, but he's just a fun guy though, you know? And, and, uh, you know, maybe to quote the beastie boys, he's crafty. And, you know, so when you have uh, guys like that, they're real fun watches. And if you're in the the Northwest part of town or want to make the trip tonight, it is the twos in Chattanooga FC, and that'll be on the network pregame at 7, a little after 7.30 for kick. Do you have any clue what this Derby should be named, by the way? Has this has this been rattled around in the SNS offices as to what we should call Chattanooga FC uh, VS period ATL UTD2? Oh, yeah, a little bit. So oh, okay. Chattanooga FC, like, I, I love that club. I really do because – they were they were there during the time when the Silverbacks were not and Atlanta United was not. 
mm-hmm. you know, and we, we go to Chattanooga so much and it's just like a second home to us. So like, I thought a lot about this actually. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. And, uh, I haven't really come up with anything like that just kind of hit home, but I've like, there's, there's some good ones because I was trying to figure out like what, what ties the two cities together. And I think the biggest one is their kind of shared history of being like railroad towns. Okay. And so <laughs> this one, it all, I'm only saying this because it, it has the wordplay in it. Okay. Yeah. So no, like, go for it. Yeah. Choo choo challenge. All okay. right. All right. But I cannot in good conscience call a Darby the choo choo challenge. Okay. So, um, another one was choo choo challenge after the, uh, what was it? Uh, the train. Uh-huh. Train wreck tussle was okay. one that popped up. Okay. Um, the, but I haven't really come up with anything good as far as like, you know, typically you say like the whatever Darby, yeah. Yeah. you know, or rivalry. And and I just haven't really come up with anything that, that makes it sound good using those words. The age of aquariums. Um, wait. Oh yeah, that's true. That is true. You have, you have two really big ones. That's, uh-huh. that's a good, that's a good tie in. The Little Debbie Darby. Ah, uh, yeah, with the moon pies. Uh huh. Because the, the little, little, little Debbie's offices are in are are in suburban Chattanooga. Yeah, you do a Little Debbie and then something with the moon pies. Oh, How they, um, man, I didn't even think about the aquarium though, or or the Little Debbie. There's also, I mean, if you wanted to go the fast food route, yeah. um, when you gotta have it, you gotta have it. Yeah, pick one in Atlanta, but then you also have Crystal in yes, Chattanooga. Absolutely. Um, uh, let's see. So something with squares, uh, uh, so, something involving squares. So that is officially the QOD. What in the wide world of sports do we call this rivalry between Atlanta United two and Chattanooga FC? That, that is, that is the million dollar question. What There's is the good one in the chat? Yeah. So let's see. So we've got, Oh, the trial and the tracks, Alex Basine's on fire this morning. So, uh, Alex Basine has, uh, the trial on the tracks. He, he changed his, he changed his preposition. Uh, so yes, David Cokes and moon pies. We've got to, we got to think about that. Uh, Kefsi says he feels like Colorado might fight about it. Uh, how old is Chris Armis and can he pass up Nick Firmino? They play the same position. The two tracks tussle. And so, uh, Kefsi, Kefsi seconds the trial on the tracks. So, uh, looks like early returns of the trial on the tracks. Uh, so we were trying to think of something with I-75. We were trying to think of something, but yeah, literally as you were going through everything that's in Chattanooga, I was like, oh, the age of aquariums. Yeah, the aquarium was a good one. I wasn't even thinking that route. And I love the Tennessee Aquarium. Mm-hmm. I love it. And I obviously love the Georgia one as well, except the fact that it's packed all the time. So mm-hmm. Yes. So, uh, oh, so KFC was saying it's about the Mountain View. My bad. Okay. So Alex isn't wearing they, his- that was. That was the other one, and I couldn't think of anything good. But like you know, you have Lookout Mountain, and like yeah. it's famous for being in Tennessee, but most of it's actually in Georgia. Yeah. So I thought that could be like a good point of contention, but I mean, I just there's nothing that it, like L right. Yeah. Like what would work with with Lookout Mountain? Uh, ugh, uh, the 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 Lookout Mountain lockup. Ah, that's that's solid. I like that. Okay, I like that. So maybe this is something that SNS puts to its readers as well. It's like, yeah, a, this is a, this is a, we're going to have to figure this out. Yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's what we figure out with this, with this Darby. Um, and, and for Steve Cook and for Atlanta United too, it's an opportunity once again to uh, flush, but not forget considering what has happened over the last two matches with uh, FC Cincinnati two and Philadelphia union two, who are, as you, you know, as you normally would associate, they are your second clubs. They have, uh, the, the DNA and the, the thought pattern of your parent clubs. And with uh, with Philadelphia, it was two absolute golosos. And if you go back and listen to Jason's call, there was some uh, adventurous uh, officiating. We'll go ahead and phrase <laughs> it that way. Yep. And then with uh, FC Cincinnati, too, on, on the weekend, it's the, the, the battle that you traditionally have with all of your second teams. It's like you, you, you have first team players coming down for insert reason here reps injury rehab you've got the the second uh, team players that are there consistently then you have the academy folks that are brought in and it's trying to come up with that venn diagram and the jigsaw puzzle of trying to figure out how the pieces fit And now you're going up against uh, as steve has said tonight a team that is 
its own first team. I mean, there it's like this is not CFC two. This is this is Chattanooga Football Club coming in with experienced players, and it will be in, in, interesting to see what the mix will be tonight for uh, Atlanta United too. And they're good. It's not like this is a, you know, th- this is their first team, but eh, like this, yeah. they're a solid team. They yeah. really are, and they play really good football. I know y'all have had Rod. Coach Rod on the show. We've had him on the show last year. Like his philosophy to the game is very disciplined and he he gets everything I think he possibly can out of his players. And so I think anybody that maybe doesn't pay much attention to next pro might look at this match and at face value, they might see, oh, well, Chattanooga's the newcomers. Like they're not going to be that great. They're going to have that newcomer uh, syndrome. Not so and fast, my friend. That is that is not even kind of close to the truth. So <laughs> like this, this one, how I, I would argue that I would going into this three game stretch, mm-hmm. it would be maybe Philly, notwithstanding, because Philly has a great academy uh and a great pipeline. But I would argue that this match would be the one I would have been most fearful about. Because a lot of like what you said, they are a first team and they are out for blood. They yeah. want to play the game and they're going to come out hot. They're going to come out. And for them, MLS Next Pro is about winning MLS Next Pro. It's it's not like they're, of course, you're going to want to move up to bigger, better leagues, whatever. I get that. But for Chattanooga FC, for Carolina Core, like for some of these teams, they're going into it. This is their league and they're going to want to win it. And so that's what they're going to shoot for. Yep. Uh, right now, as things stand in the Southeast, Chattanooga is leading the division with the win that they got on the weekend. And they are two points ahead of Messi and Friends B. And uh, Purple Team is in third. Uh, I think it was uh, Hunt City, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so uh, Chattanooga is at 12 points. And they are through five matches. They're right now on top in the Southeast division and making a statement in the Eastern Conference. So uh, the the uh, – uh, elongated plug for going to watch the twos tonight. You get to see the, and we got into this discussion yesterday about Atlanta United two. And uh, there were some folks on the media that is social saying it's a hard watch. And I, I was positing as a part of the discussion that you are there to have people learn. Yes. Winning is a, a part of it, but you're also there to make sure that the younger players learn about what it's like in the club, what it's like to have this philosophy and and learn and grow inside this philosophy. And yes, there are some growing pains that are associated with it, but then you get to see the the end result of individuals like a Noah Cobb, who's been in the system since he was 15 and been playing USL championship, playing up against folks twice his age, not backing down. You're seeing what Noah's up to. Efren Morales is another example of that here at center back university, as I call it, where you have all of these guys, Tony Annan thought Efren Morales was a center back literally. And so you see what Ephra is doing, and now Ephra is the next one in line. And to continue to see folks like Aiden Torres, Caden Moore, uh, all of these folks, and, and those folks that are there on the twos deals, like Noble Okello, who we saw with Toronto FC. And so all of these, and Javi Armas. So you get to see all these different things coming together. Yes, it is a difficult jigsaw puzzle. Yes, the staff enjoys that challenge and tries to integrate it as best they can on a day-to-day basis. But you get to sit there and see, yeah, I saw him win. And so that was, uh, you know, that's what you're staring at here with Atlanta United too. Yeah, so on the show last week, it was actually funny because Tommy, he asked me on the live show, sell me on watching the twos. Whoa. And okay. yeah, and my answer was, you have to go into it with the mindset that you're watching individual players. Like, if you get a win, that's a bonus. You, you, I mean, go to support them. Like, if you're near Kennesaw, go watch them because one, Fifth third is just a fun venue because you, you're so close, right? You're right there. You can hear everything on the pitch. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> yep. Um, but, you know, yeah, they may go and they may have rough matches. They may have really rough matches. But but watch the Luke Brennans. Watch the Aiden Torres's. Watch, you know, uh, the moments like when an Ashton Gordon gets gets to play or, you know, some of these guys. And, and just – Think about what could be as they continue to grow, because what they are now is not going to be the same thing they are a year from now or four years from now. So, yeah, I mean, you're going to see an identity, and I think we see that week in and week out, but also you're not looking at a polished 
prime first team when you watch the twos and and most to like academy you know feeder teams in mls next pro you're not you're not seeing a uh a full full product at this point so you don't go to it with the same mindset that you're going to Mercedes Benz stadium and you're watching the first team play. So yeah, I mean, if, if you, if you want to have a deeper knowledge of what could be in a, in a couple of years, you know, we were, we were shouting all the the things about Noah Cobb years ago. We were shouting all the things about um, Luke Brennan years ago and all that's coming to fruition. Nick Firmino, another one, Mm -hmm. maybe not as long, but you know, another one. Yeah. So it's just you just can't go into it with the same mindset that you're you're watching a division one team. It's just that's not what it is. But go and have fun mostly. Like go have fun because it is a fun venue. It's a fun place to go. And going back to Javier Armas, like he, one of the things he said in that interview yesterday was like, come out and support us because soccer players, like we thrive on playing in full stadiums. And understandably, like Fifth Third Bank might not be full, but they have a decent turnout and it could be better. Go enjoy it. Like tickets are cheap. Mm-hmm. Hey, go have fun, you know, and, and then you go like for this one tonight, go watch Chattanooga FC, which is a, a good football team. They're local. If you then want to go see them play they're in hour and a half, two hour drive, you know, mm-hmm. like it just expand your horizons a little bit just because it's fun. Yeah. And so it is all a part of the, the three dimensional approach that we like to, to talk about here is support your local clubs and, if it's NPSL in your in your own you know if, in your own part of the world, if it's an NPSL club, great. If it's a Gulf Coast Premier League team, great. If it's a, if it's an MLS Next Pro, great. If it's you know USL League One, fantastic. USL Championship, whatever. Support your local clubs, and you can sit there and and, and be a part of helping grow the game and, and exposing it to others. And you know it's like you know they told two friends and so on and so on and so on. And that way you can spread the education of what's going on. And spread the the support for a club, which is what we're all here for anyway, because we've always said rising tide lifts all boats. And the twos are an example of that, where you can have that education and you can have that knowledge base and tell others about what's going on. And they can become more knowledgeable and they can become engaged. And it turns into a great circle that you can have with Atlanta United, too, as we're talking about in this instance. Yeah, uh, my my middle son, the one that is is actively. um playing a lot this year he so the first time he got to see fifth third was actually at the open cup the disastrous open cup last year okay um which we will not speak of anymore but mm-hmm. you know he got to see the venue and then he got to see kind of like how intimate it is and how like close you get and, and just how fun it is um and then they went back we went with the opener this year I was there covering it. They were down in the stands. Sure. He had been asking to go back since since that open cup match. And it, like for us, it's it's a it's a drive. It's a drive. Yes. Um quite the drive. But it's something that we we're trying to do more of this year because, you know, for one, like he enjoys it because it's it's just a diff a different atmosphere. But you know, you gotta think too, you're I mean, if you some of you guys have kids, like you're you're seeing some of these kids that are playing that are, you know, 15. Six Aiden Torres just turned 16 like a month ago. I know. You know? So in a in a way, it's a little bit of a, a more, uh, I think, an inspiration than maybe going and seeing somebody like Tiago Amada, who in a lot of ways seems like that's that's just that superstar that that's going to be a level that's very difficult to get to. Not impossible. I'll never say that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you see a kid like Aiden Torres or like Caleb Wiley, who has spent most of their life here in the same town that you're growing up in as a kid, like. I think it adds just a different familiarity to it. And yeah, then of course, just like supporting them in the same way that you would, the first team is important because it gives them the ability to kind of thrive on that environment, whereas they might not somewhere else. And you can yell at officials at close range too. Yes, which they- my son did. And, and then they- I heard about it later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and they can hear you too. And so, uh-huh. Yeah, and, and that's it. You could be LGP and just yell at officials and be yeah. you know, one of the large voices there at Fifth Third. So uh, if you can make it tonight, fantastic. We'll love to see you once again, 7 o'clock pregame, a little after 7.30 kick. Me, Jarrett, and Maddie on uh, uh, on the SDH Network with Chattanooga FC and Atlanta United, too. Uh, you can't escape it before we go forward. Uh, now, that you've, now that we've gotten into the midweek, after what's happened the last two times out, and it is five points left on the table, 
what has I will I will go away from the weekend and I will focus on Monday and Tuesday since we see you on Wednesdays. What has been the overarching conversation pieces there at SNS about Atlanta United as they're getting ready for a match in Chicago against uh, a team that I think once again still having issues down the left hand side because not everybody's back at full strength. Chase Gasper's still out. Andrew Gutman was on the bench last time. You're still trying to figure out what to do at left back. I think opportunities are there for Atlanta United going forward in this match against the fire at the spaceship on the weekend. I think, you know, one of the things that we've talked about a lot is you have to win this game. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we can talk about the road record all day mm-hmm. and, and beat the dead horse all day. This one wouldn't be as big of a deal had you not dropped five points in the last two matches. And and you could even argue you dropped seven because you go back to New York City. And, and I mean, either team could have won that game, but Atlanta could have won that game very easily. And I, so in a way, that one feels a little bit like a tough pill to swallow, but nothing like Philly and Cincinnati. Philly and Cincinnati are great teams. They You can tell the scouting that they did going into these matches. Chicago is not a great team. I mean, objectively, like they're not a great team. They're just, they're struggling. And so take away the road aspect. You, you've got to win this game. You have to get three points. Like Shakiri, who has admittedly not been as great as he should have been, probably won't even play anyway. And so, and you've already beat them once recently. So if there's any game that you need to turn around a lot of things, that are going on right now, it's this one because, you know, you, you always want the road win because you need it. You need to improve your road record. That's was such a focal point in the preseason. And then you just, you've got to start getting three points because you, you think about what could have been, you know, we, we always do that. Mm-hmm. Well, what could have been had they done what they needed to do in the past three matches, they would be sitting in first or second right now. And so that's, that's frustrating. Um, as far as matchups, like I've done a little bit of like looking into it. I feel like we just did it for, you know, the previous match. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think Chicago overall is just weaker in just about every position than Atlanta. And I think if, if there's one thing like Atlanta wants to focus inward, they have got to get the same work rate out of the left wing as they are getting out of Saba on the right wing. And we can have a discussion about Saba who I think has just been the unluckiest man on the planet with finishing yeah. lately. Yeah. He's, he's doing all the great things. He leads the team. No, I'm sorry. He is 0.2 behind Yakamakis and expected goals. He's at three right now. Mm-hmm. Yakamakis is 3.2. He's getting in all the right places, doing all the right things. He's defensively actually been really good and he has got no credit for that. Um, but you're not quite getting the same production out of the left hand side. Of course, injuries. You've had a lot, a lot going on there. Yeah. But I think if you're if you're going to focus inward, like Pineda and all of the players have talked about this year, you're going to have to find something that makes that left side work as well as Saba and Brooks do on the right. And maybe that's just getting healthy. I don't know. But I do think that Atlanta can go into this match and just out talent Chicago in pretty much every position on the field. When we've been focusing on the left, I mean, yes, it is a bit of a loose construct anyway, because we'll sit there and the starting 11, as it is pictured, uh, sometimes not accurately, uh, but uh, formationally anyway, formations we've always thought of as a bit of a loose construct. So, yes, you're in a 4-3-3. Yes, these players are in the graphic that we see on television. But as soon as the whistle goes, what you've seen in that television graphic will not always apply. It is not a static kind of a thing. Yep. We have seen Saba start on the right-hand side. There have been times when uh, Gonzalo Pineda has called for a switch, and we see Saba creating problems on the left. So, you know, is it, you know, uh, until it is figured out what happens on the left and, and what I would posit is, uh, and Jared is probably along these same lines, is that uh, Mosqueda right now is probably right at his best as uh, one of those super subs that gives you 20 or 30 and comes in and runs against tired legs at a back line and drives him crazy. Uh, 
Tyler Wolf has had opportunities. And I think that with Shonday Silva, Shonday seems to be a rhythm guy. It's like you, you bring him in, he hits that first jumper, you keep feeding him. And if he's not hitting the jump shot, then you try to feed him to get the, the shooter out of the slump, and then we see where it is. But I think that injuries also where Shonday is concerned are injuries where Shonday, yeah, I, I did have that right with the subject verb agreement, <laughs> where, where Shonday is concerned, injuries kind of take him that extra step back. And so you've got to get him into game rhythm, and then you've got to get him into rhythm rhythm when it comes to shooting and being active on the left. And so you're stuck with this. You're stuck with multiple questions on the left-hand side, and that was why Cincinnati flopped miles from right center back to left center back to guard against Saba and Brooks coming down the Atlanta attacking right and say, okay, tell you what. You're going to have to beat us with activity off the left-hand side or big switches in moments. And so, you know, that that worked for Cincinnati on the weekend, flopping miles and trying to protect against Brooks and Saba getting after you. Yeah, and admittedly, like, Brooks and Saba gave Miles Robinson hell. Like, it was – they they did well. I mean, but, but Miles did well, too, and Miles paid for it with his body a couple of times. Mm. But – yeah, we did. We talked about the the one in, the one alleged incident that uh, raised the people's eyebrow, at least here on. on yeah, know. a little 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 sketch, but mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Learn, I, le- learning the ways of the dark arts at Philadelphia Light. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, and my my wife was even saying like, <laughs> wow, yeah, we like we were just getting back from our anniversary from the Great Wolf Lodge, and we were watching the game, and she was like. Wow, they've changed Miles Robinson. <laughs> I was like, it didn't take long, did it? Um, but no, I mean, I think I think you're spot on with the Shonda thing. Like he he is he's a flair guy, and I don't just mean flair as in like the dribbly boy kind of stuff. Like he feeds off of I think a lot of things, like the crowd. I think that is very very much like he's a personality guy. He really is, and um, if he can get going. Man, he's he's fun to watch, and he's going to create opportunities, and he's going to create chances. But if he's not, you have the team, coaching staff, everybody has to figure out a way to get him involved. Yeah. Because when he is involved, he's one of the better left wingers wingers in MLS. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, there's just it's it's not been I think good enough at this point. But uh, yeah, choppy choppiness, injuries notwithstanding, like. I still don't think you need to like make any moves, but yeah. with the Mosquera thing, I think I, I was screaming from the rooftops and, and uh, a lot of people disagreed with me um, that Tyler Wolf should have started this match. And you just brought in Edwin as you did mm-hmm. as that guy that causes absolute chaos Yes, on tired legs because it's worked every single time it's worked. Like he, when he does this, when he comes in in the 60th minute or whatever, he is uncontrolled chaos, and, and somebody <laughs> mentioned it. Uh, and I, I'm so sorry because I'm not going to give credit to the right person, but it was mentioned in a tweet or somewhere Discord yeah. Yeah. that he is so chaotic, so chaotic that he doesn't even know how to control his own chaos, which is true. I think his decision making, maybe a little bit in the final third, is just like it's almost like his body's moving too quick for his mind to figure out what to do. That's okay though, like yeah. he is a much more refined product than he was a year ago. No and he's still tracking in the right direction. And I like Edwin Mosquera a lot. I just don't, I think he earned the starting spot. That, that narrative has been thrown out. He earned that starting spot. I just don't think he needed to have it because he's so much more effective being a super sub quote unquote. Um, I think you go into this one against Chicago. And if Shonda cannot start, I think you you throw Tyler Wolf out there, and I know people might not like that. There's been some you know arguments about Tyler, right? Um, I still think you start him. He's still getting in the right places. He just hasn't been finishing. He you know hasn't maybe had like the the great season that he had last last year so far, right? Um, but yeah, give him time. Let him get. Let him tire out whoever he can tire out, and then you bring on Edwin and let Edwin do what he does. And I think you'll have success there. Injuries that was five two weeks ago. It was less than five rounding off various stages of getting back healthy. Gigi came in and gave you 30. And uh, that that list of five seems to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller where 
Steon seems to be getting closer to making his appearances. I uh, don't think we have a uh, – I think Derek is still another couple of weeks away at the back. Uh, I'm trying to, to think of uh, – I don't know. I don't think we have a Jamal update yet. So uh, – I can I can run through if you want me run, to run them. Go for it. I can run because I was there yesterday and I was trying give to keep my update, Give me my updates from yesterday, sir. All right, so let's see. Steon Gregerson came out with he didn't have like a brace on his leg or anything. He came out trained with the first team. Okay. He trained all the way up until the very last drill that they did. So he trained, let's say, eighty percent of the day with the okay. team. Got it. Um, Jamal Tiare is progressing much faster than I think they thought. Mm -hmm. um, he was out yesterday, uh, I think training on his own, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, Derek Williams was training on his own. He was running right there in front of us, so he was just kind of doing stuff with the physios. Uh, Shonday also doing stuff with the physios, and the, I think the thought process behind that is um, he was good to be a sub last weekend, but they're also not trying to force too much. Yeah. Um, so I, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't start again this weekend. I think it's, I think it's going to be Tyler Wolf or Mosquera. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's on his way. Um, and then let's see, I'm missing Noah and the migraine. Yes, that was okay. So Noah, Noah, first one back out to the training ground as, as always, the very first one out of the building onto the pitch. Um, and apparently is, is he's feeling good. He's all set. He just, he had a migraine to where he couldn't literally could not see well. And it, and it sucks because he was having such a good game. I thought, um, but yeah, he's, he's over it. And it was just one of those freak things. Hopefully that's not like, you know, some people just have those like consistent migraines that they just pop up whenever. Hopefully that's not a thing. Yeah. But yeah. Um, that's I think that's allowed. everybody. Yeah. That's not allowed. Uh, con yeah. continual migraines not allowed, but that is we caught when we caught up with Abe Gordon on Monday. Abe suffers from migraines and his affect him differently when it's not uh, you know the way that it affected Noah there at, at 45. But uh, migraines affect folks in, in different ways. And to hear about Noah and getting back out there, you're hoping that it is uh, that it is something that that can be uh, monitored slash controlled and that Noah, you know, comes through it and then uh, keeps track of his migraines and that the migraines behave, I guess is probably what I'm saying when it comes and, to. Yeah. And I also know, like, again, I, I always mention that about Noah with him being the first one out of the building, because I think it, it shows his character. Like it shows he wants this so bad. So he would not have been okay being subbed out at halftime mm -hmm. if he didn't have an issue like he he had to come out mm -hmm. so i mean yeah i i know i know people that get migraines that are just like incapacitating and apparently this was one of those for noah yeah you've got to go into a dark room shut it down lay on a sofa leave me alone don't talk to me because i can see your words and they're vibrating in front of my face yep. and you can't uh you can't navigate those kinds of things yep uh we had the trade deadline, uh, the, the transfer deadline, the early one anyway, before the rules change in the summer. A and we get to either add ADP or a U22 and go three and three or whatever with the new rules coming up in the summer. And yesterday it uh, was another addition for, uh, for Messi and friends. You, you get an injury. It's like get, uh, lose one, get one. It, literally, it's like you're, you're sitting there and it's like uh, I'm, I'm shifting players. And now they brought in yet another player. Uh, I wish for the love of all that is holy, there you go, properly hydrate, yes, that we knew what the rules of engagement were and where folks were going up against the cap because you put uh, Gomez on the shelf for six weeks, then you bring in Matias Rojas, and it is a it is a loan toward the end of this season with another couple of years behind it as options. But uh, I know that folks are going to look at the team at the top of the Eastern Conference and sit there and go, bruh. How do you do this? And yes, it might be financial witchcraft from Chris Henderson, but once again, I think that it 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 screams that we need to know, especially coming up toward deadlines and going into trade periods, where things stand with folks and why folks can do what they do. And it's I think it's one of the things that is one of the big items at the top of my list to get more transparency when it comes to the financials in this league. 
because people are raising their going, dude, how do you do this? And Chris Anderson's like, yep, I got it covered. Yeah, I'm good. And I'm not going to reveal any secrets because right now I've, I've figured out the cheat code and I'm using it and I'm not telling it to anybody. Mm. That's what it feels like. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, same in LA with Giroux. It's like, okay, so seriously, you're bringing in Olivier Giroux. Yep. You're, you're bringing Giroux, like the, 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 one of the most handsome men in all of soccer. You're bringing him in. John Thornton. Yep. Yep. Like, like, what are you offering? Like it, Atlanta, I, I, I don't know that you can do this in the roster rules. I'm sure you can because, it, I mean, they kind of did it with Messi with the Apple TV deal and stuff. But, like, we have Coke. Yeah, you got to do an NIL deal here somehow. Yeah, we've got, like, so many giant corporations that I'm sure would be totally happy sponsoring some big-time players to come to Atlanta. If we pay them a dollar, <laughs> mm-hmm. and yet they're making tons of money from a giant corporate sponsor – Hey man, like let's jump in that boat. If that's how we got to get around fake monopoly money and gam or whatever, do it. I don't care. But yeah, I, I mean, I would just love to see the spreadsheet for some of these teams. I just, I, I'm curious. And admittedly, like I, I could care less what every other team except for Atlanta does. With the caveat that I just want to look at Miami's and say, like, <laughs> what are y'all doing? I'm just want to. I'm just. I just want to know. So, so somebody's going to write a book on it one day. Yeah. So you're so you're paying him fifty two thousand dollars and and giving him a massive seven figure apartment in Boynton Beach or whatever. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's literally the NIL deals in Major League Soccer are would be fantastic to to find out about. And it, it literally it's like you're you're going with all of these big names. Sure, you're only paying Hugo Lloris three hundred thousand dollars. Is Jason? Right. Like, yes. And, and, you know, you have Messi all over the place with the ads. Speaking of that and his deal, it, it is in, in the ether that Apple might be signing the contract for the Club World Cup. Yeah. And that might make things more interesting and might draw more eyeballs to Major League Soccer if they sign the Club World Cup. And if I'm not mistaken... I believe the Club World Cup has wild cards that they can introduce into the tournament in this new 720 team format that they're bringing to the table. Yeah. And, and what do you bet? I, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. Hear me out here for a second. If Apple was to get the Club World Cup, and you can go ahead and start the, the helicopter noises in the background if, if you want. <laughs> If Apple was you close the windows, John. Yeah, you know, if if Apple was to get the Club World Cup, say, dot dot dot, perhaps maybe. And like I said, I'll, I'll when you give the answer, I'll do the search on the wild card thing. But I thought I saw somewhere that there could be wild card entrance in the Club World Cup in 2025. So if Apple was to say, oh, I don't know get the contract and get the the streaming rights a it would draw more eyes to their major league soccer product b there is a club that that is in this major league soccer product if this wild card status does in fact exist that that you know might have a bit of a, a player with a bit of a tie to uh subscribers and 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 earning more money if folks decide that they want to up for apple tv i'm, I'm just thinking that Maybe, possibly, for a wild card in this club World Cup that you could find a way for a particular club down down in South Florida to be in this tournament that you might be getting the the streaming rights for. I mean, am I? I I'm thinking out loud. You know, it's just something that's popping into my head, Tyler. I, I just it's it's there, and it, it, I feel like Gilbert Gottfried. It's 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 right there. It's just it's it's, it's a thought. It, it's just like well, what if we have this team over here that's in the property that that's attached to to Apple TV, and then Apple TV has this thing. What if you know this team that's over here that's you know separated by this one entity and idea? What if this team was to oh I don't know jump over and leapfrog into this third into this third pot here for the Club World Cup? Am I far off? Am I? Can't. I here? I can't imagine where you're getting that from. I'm just, I can't imagine that was just pulled out of thin air. I'm just, you know, it was just something that it, I can, it, I can literally hear 
Don Garber driving to the bank as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, if if uh, if if one plus one equals eleven, th then you're ending up with it, and, and you're like, okay, Club World Cup, you're expanding into like nine gazillion folks. Yeah, a and you know, uh, with the U.S. hosting the tourney, thirty-two teams, eight groups, four teams. It would only make sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm looking at the list of, of teams now so far. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, we have time. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you have. Oh, that's what it is. That's what it is. You have your four CONCACAF teams. Uh-huh. Which right now are Monterey. Uh-huh. Seattle Sounders. Uh-huh. Leon. Uh-huh. To be determined. Uh-huh. So that one will go to the winner of the Champions Cup for this year. Uh huh. But then, uh huh. Separated down below UEFA, OFC, and mm -hmm. Conmebol, mm -hmm. you have the host slot that also belongs to Concacaf. Ah. Uh, so. Ah. Uh, there is there is your answer. Ah. Uh, or at least part of your answer. Okay. You know the hosting slot will go to. I'm. I'm sure it's gonna be like. Sharknado FC. <laughs> I mean, it, you, it, you know, it could be it could be our buddy John Schuster and our friends at Duluth FC out of the NPSL. You there know, we go. You could have some curling going on in the in the opening ceremony. <laughs> so 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 uh, so I'm not far off with that host slot idea. No, I think I think you're spot on. Okay. I think that's exactly what's going to happen uh, because let's see, you have. Mm -hmm. Where does Philly fall into this? Philly falls into this somewhere. Uh, Probably in the, the CONCACAF hemispheric considerations. Yeah, I'm trying to see. I don't know. I'll have to read this later. But, yeah, I'll have to read this later and figure yes. it out. But, yeah, I mean, those are the four. Well, those are the three. Plus, you have two spots left over, one being the host team. Yes, the host mm -hmm. team. Yeah. Yeah. And so perhaps, you know, in, in a new stadium that is uh, allegedly, possibly, probably being constructed near an airport in South Florida that's uh -huh. really off of a golf course. Uh, I can't the, imagine how, the, how this was all planned out. I just, I'm just saying. I just, it was an idea. Uh, so when is the, the, when is the next live SNS, sir? Uh, that is going to be tonight. Okay. And uh, at 7, 7 o'clock. Okay. Um, Are you going to be live from Kennesaw doing the show? No, I, that would be really cool. I actually, I would love to do that if I can make it happen. Because uh, I, I really wanted to see this game in person. I really did the, the twos in Chattanooga. Just do, um, just do it on your phone. Just literally, you go, you go to the match. You're in the press box. You're hanging out with the rest of us, and and, uh, and Sid and Tommy are are in their imitation palatial studios, and you're actually live on the scene and not allowed to show any actual game video. So, I mean, <laughs> hi, I'm here in Kennesaw. You know, it's pointed at you in the stands, and I'm having a great old time. Where are you two? I'm here in my, I'm here in my office. <laughs> Tommy, I'm here in Ohio. Yeah, Tommy. That, that great state of the union. Yes, Tom, Tommy's in Ohio. I mean, Tommy should go either to, to Northern Kentucky University and go see FCC2 or go to Historic Crew Stadium and go check out, uh, and go check out uh, Crew 2. I mean, that's, you know. Go, go! I keep telling him. It's like, go I keep telling him he he's all hyped up because they're they're potentially well. I guess there's talk of Cleveland getting yeah. a women's team. Okay, and there's also well. I think there's also a uh, USL franchise that yeah. headed to Cleveland in the next couple of years too. So yep. So uh, yes, he's invest, excited. invest and invest well. Uh, as always, my friend, thanks for coming on for Wall Pass Wednesdays and sharing your wisdom. Uh, how can folks follow along on all of the media that uh, Scarves and spikes are up to uh twitter slash x whatever yeah is scarves the letter in spikes mm -hmm. and then scarves and spikes.com is probably the easiest place to go because it's got all the links and all the good stuff mm -hmm. um and then yeah i'm atl pilgrim as you can see on buy the screen the, buy the gear buy the gear huh? buy, buy the gear and buy the stuff oh yes yes please please coffee mug beer glass hat hoodie whatever walking yeah. billboard here yeah, not so on purpose it's just i feel like if I don't wear this hoodie now, mm -hmm. I'm rapidly running out of days in Georgia that I can wear it. <laughs> so I mean, that's why when we're here in the 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 uh, the air conditioned environs, you know, we're always we're always repping yeah. the uh, 
you know, we're always up in the gear. So uh, as always, great to catch up with you, my friend. Uh, we will see you uh, next home match. We'll probably talk to you before then, but uh, on to Chicago and on to Chattanooga FC. Be safe. All right. Thank you. I will drop some, some Darby names in the chat. Yes. Darby names in the chat. So that is the QOD. So Tyler's going to do that. He's going to continue to be hydrated and we will catch up with him when he uh, feels like he wants to crash the show. So Darby names. That's the question of the day. Darby names for the broadcast coming up tonight at seven o'clock. Atlanta United two, Chattanooga FC from the fraction. What do you call it? I know we had some good stuff early on and uh, we need to continue all of those kinds of things. Uh, I know that there, there's, there's got to be something attached to Lookout. The, the Lookout Lowdown might be the name of the show that, that uh, talks about the particular rivalry. Uh, the Lowdown Lock, uh, the, oh, the Lookout Lockup. There we go. Lookout Lockup. Uh, something like that. Um, but yes, the uh, Age of Aquarium, the uh, Lookout Lockup, and I forget what the other one was that I came up with on, on short notice, but uh, all of those are, are in consideration. So we need a good, oh, the Little Debbie Darby. Uh, we need to come up with a good. We need to come up with a good rivalry name for Atlanta United Two and Chattanooga FC. So that is part of our quest this morning. Uh, coming up at ten forty-five, as a bit of a tease for soccer's in session, we're going to catch up with uh, uh, Christopher Aiken, the head coach at Clark Central, as they're getting ready for their match tonight. We'll catch up with him a little bit. Get you ready for soccer's in session coming on at noon. Uh, it's going to be uh, Philip Thomas, the head coach at River Ridge. Chris Leone, the head coach on the boys' side for. Uh, North Gwinnett, and uh, we'll get you ready for the brackets in day two of round two. It is the boys' side in all the odd-numbered classes, 7A, 5A, 3A, single-A divisions, one and two. We'll go over all the matchups and all the finals that happened last night. That'll be here on the network at noon Eastern, and we'll roll through everything that's uh, going on when it comes to the at-official GHSA soccer playoffs. Our next match is tomorrow in Perry, where it is Trinity Christian, and our dear friend Jessica Charman, who is on the coaching staff, taking on the Perry Panthers. So Trinity Christian at Perry, 6 o'clock kick. Jason will be on a little before 6. We'll be in middle Georgia for that one. And really looking forward to seeing our friends, the Perry Panthers, because they also are uh, right there. Perry, Perry soccer. Very, very cool stuff. All right. So uh, getting ready for hour number two. Uh, let me say hi to everybody, because I haven't had the chance to, to say hi to folks uh, this morning. So morning, Dell. Morning, Alex. Morning, Tom. And uh, Tom going complete and total, uh, was it King Arthur? Uh, you know, uh, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. So uh, that's where uh, that's where Tom is this morning, but substitute the word point. Morning, Dell. Uh, and uh, morning, Kefsi. Ooh, best view of a mountain from the stadium outside of Monterey. Hmm. Ooh, that's a, wow. Monterey's a tough one to beat, though. Yeah, oh, sorry, Monterey, not Monterey like California, like um, uh, Monterey Bay when they play at CSU East Bay. Uh, while that is a pretty stadium and a pretty campus. Uh, you know, if somebody was near Pepperdine, I would say that. Uh, but Pepperdine, I mean, Pepperdine's on campus facilities with uh, right there in the the uh, Palos Verdes mountain range. Pretty close. But, you know, once again, it's Monterey and the mountain range. Gorgeous. I think, KFC, honestly, I think that that might be the leading contender. Uh, unless you go to like, I think Como, it, but it's not a mountain range. It's like uh, water. And then, then there's the ones in the Faroe Islands that are right there in the middle of the island. And it's like this small archipelago kind of a thing. So uh, mountains, Monterey might have it beat. So that might be number one with the mountains, uh, unless it's maybe in Andorra or something or our friends from Austria that uh, we had going on. Uh, trial on the tracks, Coke and Moon Pie. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see the two track tussle trial on the tracks. Uh, let's see, uh, <laughs> David, I'm not, I can't say that. Glad you're having that conversation. Morning, Kefsi, uh, Alex and Kefsi with the, uh, the thought Chattanooga does mean rock rising to a point about lookout. So the rock slash stone is a common point probably brought in by both. Uh, probably, uh, actually, probably in Alabama, probably has a say about it too. Well, that's partly ours. Three states with uh, Lookout Mountain and one range. Um, Kefsi on Atlanta United. When the defense is set, most of the forwards have been great on helping it. Gigi backtracks, Tiago backtracks, Saba backtracks. Have you seen the mileage that Saba has put in on a weekly basis? It is immense. Bart Sleesh the same way in the midfield. 
Uh, Rios coming back had that crucial stop. Dell wants to start Tyler. Emilio wants to start Tyler and then go to Mosqueda. Uh, Hutch, no, there have not been changes to the physio staff, but uh, less severe injuries, but less severe. But then you have the ones that take up a lot of time when it comes to rehab. They haven't been necessarily severe. So it's like a bone bruise, a high ankle sprain. But those are the ones, while they're not necessarily more severe, the, rehab the rehabilitation time has taken up a lot more than normal. Uh, yeah, and Dell Jinx. Uh, morning, Hutch. Morning, Emilio. Uh, I don't know. Emilio, that's a good question. Any idea how they assess NOAA testing and, and those kinds of things? It might. That That's a good question. You know, when you monitor someone with migraines, how do you monitor it? And I know, obviously, you want to keep a, a running uh, file folder of, okay, well, we did this on this day and everything's fine. And, you know, you look at your wild cards and things like that. It's like, okay. We did this, then this happened. Cause and effect, A to B, A to B, A to B, and you just have this running list. Now that you know that uh, migraines can affect NOAA, you look at all of the evidence from all of the different uh, empirical evidence that was there in the situation. So, what was his what was his heart rate? What was you know how you know what was his hydration levels? All those kinds of things. And so, with the uh, with the uh, the backpack or the uh, the the sports apparatus that's there, uh, the sports tank top. Uh, you probably have a boatload of empirical evidence that you can download and sit there and analyze. Okay, he was here, he did this, this, and this, and then the moment happened where levels might have changed. And then Noah, you know, you had, I imagine he was still wearing the device uh, up until a certain point when he walked into the locker room. And so physios probably look at all of that information and analyze it and have it off to the side and sit there and go, okay, how did we treat this? And then Noah was, yesterday, as Tyler said, first guy back out. So what was the transition like from the treatment and the moment that it happened to the treatment to get him back out there as, as uh, first guy for practice? So I'm sure the physio staff has a boatload of evidence that they can look at and use as, as uh, guideposts for dealing with Noah and his migraine specifically, since we know that migraines are different from person to person to person. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. But yeah, uh, KFC migraines suck. They do. I know folks who have them. Yeah. And literally is going to a dark room, lay down, lights, blinds, the whole thing. So uh, there it is. Yes, Nick's. Loris is 300,000. Yeah, sure he is. And he, <laughs> Nick's doesn't like the uh, the new Lay's Messy ad. Uh, Hutch, maybe there are Easter eggs buried in the fine print. And probably there are. There probably are MLS financing rules that Miami are unlocking and using. And when you have someone who is as, is as experienced as Chris Henderson is and John Thorrington at LAFC, then you're like, okay, this, this, and this. And I think that when Lionel Messi came into Major League Soccer and you came up with this uh, NIL deal, for lack of a better word, where you have sponsors committed to financing or helping out financing uh, you know, Michelob here, appear in this commercial and we'll give you X. So, you know, demands on your time create uh, NIL contracts and endorsement deals. So maybe it's done through, you know, uh, endorsements. I prefer to think of it these days as NIL. So what you're dealing with in Major League Soccer are NIL deals and endorsement deals. And those are not salaries. That, that's not a salary that is given to you by your club. If it just so happens that Lay's, Michelob Light, Adidas, whomever else is lining up to the table, Publix, you know, whomever's lining up to the table that wants uh, Messi's time, it is going to have to be reimbursed handsomely. And so Lionel Messi comes in, he's got his salary figure, and he is given the max DP level, but you can pretty much pay him whatever you want. The number I think that we came up with last year was over $20 million with bonuses and DP and all this kind of stuff. But then with percentages and endorsements and NIL, it rocketed to, what did they say, 50? So whatever it is, whatever that base number is, as a DP, you can get paid whatever. Then you have the endorsements over the top, which is not salary. So it is the key to it, you know, for LAFC and Olivier Giroud, just for men, Paul Mitchell, all those hallmark for the calendar. The most handsome men in Major League Soccer coming this Christmas. Those kinds of things. So it is front offices 
that sit there and they will look at it and go, okay, if we can have endorsements fund this extra pot, then that will make up for more than the actual than, than salary figures. It's like, hey, what we what we will give you in endorsements will either match or surpass what you're currently making in salary in your current employee. So you're having to be a little bit more imaginative because of the rules of engagement in Major League Soccer. But specifically where Matias Rojas is, and, and, and Olivier Giroux, we can sit there and say, okay, you're a DP. I get it. You get paid DP money. You get paid whatever under the cap, but then you come up with something on level number two, endorsements, what have you, off to the side. That's the fine print that we probably are dealing with here is the endorsement slash NIL material that we're looking at involving these big names when they walk in the door. Matias Rojas, however, is for me a larger question because how is it that you can bring in, you know, Federico Redondo? How is it that you can bring in Matias Rojas? How is it that you can bring in these players? Once you put someone on long-term injury, then you can replace that salary. I get it. But Diego Gomez is not a long-term injury replacement. It is six weeks from what we understand, six to eight. If you want to say, if you want to be uh, widening out rehab. Getting rid of DeAndre Yedlin and jettisoning, jettisoning Jean Mota using your one-time oopsie. That created space, how much we don't know, because then they brought in Redondo and then now they're bringing in Rojas. All of these different things, like I said, all of these different shuffling of the cards on the table at the trop. You've got to have a, a dealer who knows the odds and can card count like anybody else. And you're seeing that with Chris Henderson. And, and uh, you saw it last year with Carlos Bocanegro and Atlanta United when they brought in all the guys for uh, the, in the summer window. Bringing in uh, Shande and Jamal and uh, Saba. So you have individuals in that front office in Miami, here, L.A., that can go right up to the number. But I would love to know what the number is and what the navigating room is. You can go to NHLnumbers.com, and you can see where somebody is up against the cap. You can see that they are way the hell over the cap and that they're going to be paying a luxury tax. You can do the same thing in the National Basketball Association, same thing in the NFL. Major League Baseball, I think you can too. Shows you how much I watch baseball these days and, have, and haven't since the strike. Major League Soccer, you can't. And that is, that's where we are here. Because if you have fans from teams and rival teams asking questions and running black helicopter theories, of like, you know, we are kind of doing tongue-in-cheek, but we are addressing a larger issue, I think, that needs to be addressed. Transparency when it comes to signing people. Transparency does nothing but help folks understand. And I think that right now where Major League Soccer is as an entity and what they wish to accomplish, I think that just the most basic transparency when it comes to the salary, the cap, and how you designate folks and what how much space you've got would go a long way in helping us all understand the navigation that we continue to see in a couple of cities here in Major League Soccer that leaves a lot of other cities in Major League Soccer and their fans sitting there going, well, how happened? Just a little transparency. Yes, Knicks. Here's my hand. If I, if I was to look away and something was to appear in this hand, you take the parking ticket and you wad it up and then there's money in this hand, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, lookout Shakedown by Dell. Uh, Knicks is saying that uh, Rio Tinto and Harriman, Utah has got a good view. Cerro de la Silla, rather impressive. Uh, okay, so uh, SNS. Scarves and Spike says this. Focusing on Lookout, Kennesaw, and Stone Mountains, and credit to the AI generator he just used, Tri-Mountain Showdown, Three-Mountain Melee, the Summit Trio Derby, and then Aquarians, the Deep Dive Derby. Okay, all right. Got it. Okay. Morning, David. Uh, Resurgence in Phoenix Rising on our logo, the Soccer Rising Derby. Mountain riding to a point. The South is rising, Darby. And Emilio, yeah, using one's head hitting the ball can't be a good thing. It, you know, there are certain ways to, to do it. That's why they always said when I was in soccer camp growing up, you always want to use the center of the forehead. 
center of the forehead. But then obviously you can't do it every single time. You know, it's off to the side. You know, you get the shot off the crown. Sometimes those kinds of things. Soda, soda and slider derby. The cola combo clash. The cola combo clash. Three times. Um, RSL with the roofs. Yes, I think it is it RSL that simulates the mountain range or is it Colorado? I think it is RSL. And then uh, Hutch says it's like PAC funding, <laughs> dropping the political science reference. If you have to ask, you're not Miami. So that's where we are. Uh, so that's that's where we are. Uh, when, just look, a little help goes a long way. A little understanding should go a long way in bringing in more fans, especially if you're chasing after the Club World Cup, especially if you are, especially if you are, Major League Soccer or Apple TV, and Apple TV seems to be chasing after the Club World Cup because of the host slot. Mm. Just saying. Christopher Aiken from uh, Clark Central coming up in about a half hour is a bit of a preview for uh, our friends at Soccer's In Session Live presented by Kaiser Permanente. Once again, tomorrow is match day 30 for us. Match day 30 for us uh, for the uh, SDH matches of the week. And so it'll be our 30th match day tomorrow with uh, Trinity Christian and Perry. Like I said, we'll go over all the brackets. Got some guests coming up at noon for soccer's in session. But Christopher Aiken, head coach at uh, Clark Central, coming on in about a half hour to talk about his bracket and how things have laid out this season. A couple of news and notes that we had this morning. It appears that uh, La Liga president Javier Tebas has confirmed that matches will be held abroad. Could be as soon as two seasons out. The first destination will be the United States. Previously, the idea had been suggested, later shelved. Remember the lawsuit with Relevant and FIFA and everybody? Disagreements between the Spanish Federation and the Liga, but when the president with the Ru- Rubiales gone, Tebas appear- appears to feel confident that it will happen. Quote, I don't know when, but this time La Liga will play official matches abroad. I think it could be in the 25-26 season. The official match in the U.S. will strengthen our position in the North American market, which is second for La Liga after Spain. Other very competitive leagues are coming, so we can't always do the same thing. They would overtake us, Tebas told Marsa. Barca and Real Madrid reportedly keen to take La Liga abroad in the past. Originally, the first suggested fixture was a clash between Girona and Barcelona in Miami, with Girona giving up a home match in exchange for the financial boost. So the Premier League was thinking about it. Javier Tebas is already sitting there going, you know, you know, fam, I'm thinking, I'm I'm thinking that if we just do it, then we'll be the first in the door and we can do it. So there you go. So I think it looks like Javier Tebas is trying to uh, make sure that, that La Liga is first. La Liga is first in the door when it comes to figuring out uh, their future. We do have our uh, announcers uh, for the new week, and we're waiting for the official uh, official assignments. We get the official assignments and the official assignments. So when we have all of that, we'll go. Uh, Liverpool is now in talks with Feyenoord. As expected, Dennis Teclusa is leading things from the Feyenoord side. Arnis Slut can now be termed the favorite. To replace Jurgen Klopp, 10 million euro plus compensation, close to 15 million. If multiple backroom staff go with Slut, should a deal be agreed? So Spurs had initially quoted 20 million euro with uh, Slut, but it looks like it's going to be 10 plus, closer to 15 if it ends up with Liverpool getting Slut from Feyenoord. Now, next time Jarrett's on, uh, remind me to have Jarrett break down how Arnis Slut is philosophically and what his Feyenoord clubs do and how it could be seen at Liverpool if Slut is, in fact, uh, the number one guy in the clubhouse, as it appears right now, for the the job in uh, for the, the job at Liverpool to replace uh, Jurgen Klopp. So uh, you've got that. Uh, all going on. So here's, here's according to Ben Jacobs, here's what's going on. Feyenoord boss very keen on the move. 
And it also appears that Ben has paid the extra money monthly to go more than 280 characters. Uh, should be a compensation likely to be 10, 10 million euro plus should be a, should a deal be agreed closer to 15, depending on other backroom staff exits, no formal release clause in Slut's contract, which runs until 2026. Liverpool have a good relationship with Feyenoord who appreciated the formal approach coming after their KNVB cup win. Things are now moving fast with much of Liverpool's focus on Slut, despite still keeping the door open to other candidates within their thorough process. Jacobs continues, Slut's brave attacking football is seen as a big plus. Liverpool also rates Slut's attitude towards recruitment and believe he can work collaboratively, including being heavily involved in player pitches after targets are determined. Liverpool placed significant emphasis on finding not just the right footballers, but the right characters who can fit into a set style and have impact off the field. Several managers who buy into this approach have made it to the latter stages of Liverpool's process, as have ones with a track record of developing young talent. Slut can be termed the favorite to replace Jurgen Klopp at this point. So uh, that is Ben Jacobs discussing uh, Arne Slut and what it looks like for Liverpool chasing after a, a replacement for Jurgen Klopp. So Arne Slut is apparently number one in the clubhouse when it comes to uh, replacing Jurgen Klopp. Uh, Independiente coach Carlos Tevez admitted to hospital uh, very, very early this morning uh, after suffering chest pains. Independiente says tests are satisfactory, kept there as a precaution. So uh, keeping an eye on Carlos Tevez as uh as his time with coaching uh, Independiente continues. So we've got uh, that going on this morning as well. Uh, time to tour the papers and let you know what else is going on with uh, all the activity and all the places and all the things. And we mentioned tonight with uh, Atlanta United 2 and uh, Chattanooga FC, this was a match that was supposed to happen a week ago, but once again, because of uh, activity going on with Open Cup, and things like that. This one got shifted. It is not the only one that has been shifted. The Carolina core match got shifted uh, a day next month because of the Open Cup match that's happening on Tuesday, uh, the 7th against Charlotte Independence. So that match that was originally scheduled for the 7th is now Wednesday the 8th. So back-to-back -back dates at uh, Fifth Third Bank Stadium for Atlanta United. Open Cup on May 7th and Atlanta United 2 Carolina core on May 8th. But that's the only match tonight on MLSNextPro.com, Atlanta United 2, and Chattanooga FC. A couple of teams have some makeup matches that are going on this week, but it's the only one currently on the board for today. Chattanooga has a quick turnaround, as does Atlanta United 2. Chattanooga actually has a home match against Carolina Core on Saturday night at Finley. And Atlanta United 2, remember, everybody's flying up for the weekend in Chicago and suburbs because it's Atlanta United on Saturday night at uh, Soldier Field, and then it is the twos in Bridgeview at SeatGeek Sunday afternoon at two, and that one is on MLS Season Pass. So it is a full weekend for uh, Atlanta United and Atlanta United two. The twos playing three matches in an eight-day period. So uh, definitely going to be a period of time where there's going to be some uh, definite uh, Venn diagramming when it comes to lineups for Steve Cook and the staff. It's a big challenge. Uh, going on today. Uh, Premier League's got a handful of matches at 245 and 3. We'll get into the juice boxes coming up in just a little bit. Uh, Mauricio Pochettino, according to the Telegraph, is not safe beyond the summer after what happened yesterday with Chelsea and Arsenal. Who had Ben White as the captain on their fantasy team? That would be me. 5 0 yesterday. So uh, Pochettino is not safe beyond the summer. They have yet to give a decision, they meaning Bowley Clear Lake in the front office. Decision has not been made to give Pochettino a second year. Acceptance among the hierarchy is not that he is not solely to blame for the issues. You'll remember that Pochettino leading into the Arsenal match said that they needed to prove that they are more than Cole Palmer FC. Palmer did not play. That was the other end of my fantasy because I also had in Premier League fantasy Cole Palmer. That didn't go well. So now they're trying to figure out what's going on with Pochettino. And you had, uh, despite the FA Cup semifinal defeat and Tuesday night's big loss to Arsenal, he's going to remain in his job past the end of the season. Pressure growing on Pochettino amid frustration over some decisions 
still retains support within Chelsea. No recognition. He's been working with a, with a, a tough set of circumstances. This is from Matt Law at the Telegraph. Also, some belief that Pochettino cannot help be solely responsible for the difficulties they're facing, wasn't responsible for the transfer policy, and to build such a young squad. You've got a lot of players uh, with uh, futures kind of hanging in the balance. You've also got to look at profit and sustainability rules. Who has to stay? Remember, we've been talking about Connor Gallagher being a part of the departure process after the season's over. Who's going to be staying? Who's going? Uh, what's it going to look like next year? So they can't finish the season with a trophy. And now you've got to qualify for Europe. You've got a six-match run-in that includes Spurs and Villa. If you don't qualify for Europe, that means that Bully Clear Lake and the sporting directors are really going to have to think hard about whether Pochettino comes back for a second year. And there's the idea that if you keep him, you get stability. We know he's not completely and totally responsible for it. We know that uh, if we keep him for a second year, you're adding stability to it. He wasn't a part of the build. A lot of it was young guys. So you've got that going on. So like in the movies, if you sit there and you're trying to come up with your decision, if you are, if you're Todd Bowley at the edge of a lake and you've got the, the sheet of paper and you're trying to figure out what my decision is, you take the sheet of paper, you draw the line down the middle and you go, yes, no. And so the reasons to keep Mauricio Pochettino, all those things that we were talking about, you cross over. The no might be just the one thing, didn't make Europe. So you've got all of these different things. The yes side to keep him might have a longer list than the right-hand side of not to keep him having that one. So is that one on the no side going to trump and or exceed everything on the left-hand side of the ledger? And then do you go back to the board of directors if you're Todd Bowley and you sit there and you go, here's my list and here's my decision and here's my thoughts. So, uh, so yeah, you got that. You got all that to think about. So that's what you're, uh, that's what you're staring at with, uh, that's what you're staring at with Mauricio Pochettino. Two-year deal, club option for another year. A lot of folks, according to Matt Law, said that European qualification was a minimum target. But you haven't had any progress. So we'll see. Also, a word came out. It was recognized by the Premier League, uh, and it was shocking news that the Premier League admitted that two players, both the age of 19, were arrested on the weekend following alleged rape. Wolves have come forward and said, no, that's not us. For a club to come forward and sit there and say, no, that's not us, apparently, I mean, that, that is getting out in front of something. And so the, apparently there was once again what they term as inappropriate online speculation. Wolves came forward and said, no, it's not us. And so you had a lot of folks who were trying to put one and one together. Wolves is like, no, it's not us. But keep an eye out on that story and the 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 eventual uh, landing spot for a lot of that information. It appears that Manchester United and Newcastle are still 13 million pounds apart on a Dan Ashworth deal. 13 million apart. You're really going to have to come up with some. Uh, you're really going to have to come up with some coin to make sure that everything is uh, laid out in place if you're going to want Dan Ashworth. And. It will not. It's not a surprise because you are going to want uh, you're going to want this guy. And so, of course, you set a price. Absolutely. You're going to set a price. Well, if you if you want if you want him that badly. What's it worth to you? This basically, Alex, this is what Newcastle. This is what Newcastle's up to. So Newcastle is like. You want Dan Ashworth, it's 13, it's 15 million. Manchester United is like, oh, how about two? I don't think that's going over well. So right now, Manchester United is like $2 million in compensation, and they're prepared to wait to the end of the year for Dan Ashworth. But, yeah, right now, 
Newcastle wants $15 million to let uh, Ashworth go to Manchester United to be a part of the new front office. Manchester United's like, here's two. I think they're far apart. Newcastle wants 15 million pounds and another 5 million in add-ons for Ashworth, who's on gardening leave. I need video when this happens. When folks are on gardening leave, are they really gardening? Or is Dan Ashworth just kicking it in his backyard, kind of, you know, putting his feet up, reading the paper, paper of choice? You know, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a, you know, carafe of brandy hanging out off to the side. He's on his back porch. He's kicked up, feet are kicked up, reading the paper. <laughs> Reaches over, you know, you assume it's Ashworth. You know, paper's kind of hiding him. You see a hand reach out around the paper to the carafe, bring the carafe inside the paper, put the carafe back down. Is that Dan Ashworth right now or is he actually gardening? Inquiring minds. Can somebody get like a drone or a helicopter or something over Dan Ashworth's house? And here's Dan Ashworth. He's reading the newspaper. He's not gardening, but he's supposed to be on gardening leave. Back to you. I need video of Dan Ashworth gardening. If you're on gardening leave, at least you ought to garden once. Come up with the promo photo. You know, like the Ma and Pa Kettle thing where he's in overalls and he's got the pitchfork, you know. He's just kind of the pitchfork's in the ground and he's like he's like this. Dan Ashworth's in his new, like his Newcastle, his Newcastle overalls and outfit, looking like Pa Kettle on gardening leave, waiting for something to happen. But yeah, thirteen million apart plus add-ons. Newcastle's like, you want him now? Fifteen plus five. Manchester United, how about two? Yikes! I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. United are proposing compensation around the two million mark. Similar to the fee Newcastle paid to get Ashworth away from Brighton two years ago, less than the $4 million that was reported at the time. Sir Jim Ratcliffe had talks with Amanda Staveley, and shocking no one, they're still well apart in their evaluations. United feel that their approach for Ashworth, according to Ducker, is no different to the way Newcastle pursued the former FA technical director when he was at Brighton, and apparently are surprised by the club's financial demands. Sir Jim Ratcliffe has apparently been critical publicly of Newcastle's positioning. I don't think that really goes over well. So, little expectation of Ashworth starting before the summer. According to uh, Ducker, here's that phrase. It's understood United would be willing to pay a small uplift on the $2 million if there was the prospect of bringing in Ashworth before the summer. But they are not going to be strong-armed. United confirmed the appointment of Jason Wilcox as technical director on Friday, and apparently Wilcox has said, you know, he walks up to Eric Ten Hag, and and apparently Jason Wilcox comes walking into his new gig. He goes up to Ten Hag and and tells Ten Hag, uh, you have to play the new Manchester United way. Starting against Sheffield United. And this is, of course, with uh, you know, with, with uh, the players that you have right now. You have to play in a new manner. Starting with Sheffield United. If Ten Hag, and this is uh, social media overseas, so once again, take it for what it's worth. If Ten Hag does not deliver a possession-based style of play in the remaining weeks of the season, his future looks limited. How do you think that's going over? You're new at your gig. You come walking in the door. And you are apparently, allegedly, possibly, probably, maybe told, you have to change things philosophically with the players you have on hand. And uh, you've got to do it now. Here's your runway, and it starts with Sheffield United. I mean, yes, Sheffield United is at the bottom of the table and are probably going to get relegated unless they catch fire for the remainder of the season. But yeah, you're you're new in the gig. You tell them you got to change with the players you got, or we're going to look at your future. Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, Emilio is like Ted Baxter. I, I just have this vision of uh, Judge Smales and Noon and Danny Noonan in the office. Denny, are you on the side of goodness or badness? 
Jason Jason Wilcox rocking in his chair, blocked by a lamp. Ten Hog kind of <laughs> looking looking around either side of the lamp. Ten Hog, I want to be good. And then Wilcox goes, good, 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 good. That's what I feel is happening right now with Manchester United. And like I said, Drew Dickinson can sit there and and blow his stack on it. But that's what this seems like to me. Denny, if you want to play on goodness or badness, what side are you on? So, yes, apparently Jason Wilcox has told Eric Ten Hag that he uh, has to, that he's got to do it in that way. And I can't wait to see it. Because if you try it and it uh, does not work, are you not putting Eric Ten Hag in a position to fail right out of the blocks? But, you know, as as we sit here and think about it, I mean, really? When a new boss comes in, when somebody new buys your business, yes, you do have to prove yourself all over again. That's just how it is. New boss buys it. He brings in his bosses. You have to make sure that you're proving yourself all over again. But how many of us, show of hand, legitimately thought that once Sir Jim Ratcliffe's sale uh, purchase of Manchester United was going to happen, that he legitimately was going to hang on to Eric Ten Hag. You want to bring in your own people. Jason Wilcox, to me right now, legitimately is just one of those entities where it is Judge Smales and Danny Noonan in the office. That literally is what I'm staring at. So Dell says, Ten Hag is gone, Zidane's incoming. Well, but the thing is, Dell, you're seeing, you're seeing with Manchester United right now, they're trying to trim a lot off the budget. They're looking at redundancies. So I don't know how much money they really can spend on a well, on a new manager that would be the size of Ten Hag. Legitimately, I don't. I just, I, I don't know. Can you spend that kind of money? And would Zidane want it, first and foremost? Um, you know, would, would Zinedine Zidane finally decide, you know, no, I don't want the French national gig. I'll go ahead and go to Manchester United. That's the first question. I still don't think that he would. I still think he's happy and he's happy and he's chilling. He's chilling. I, I just don't, I don't see it. I think that he's still hanging out for national team gigs. He's kicking it back. He's on gardening duty, except that he's got a lot. He's got a lot of money that he can just sit there and fiddle with. Zidane's on gardening duty too. It's just that he ain't gardening. He's staring at a beach. He's staring at a beach, and it's going to take a lot to get him into an actual coaching gig on a weekly basis with a club. He's going to want that grind. I don't know if he wants that grind, but with. Manchester United looking at all of their finances and looking at redundancies and trimming travel and cutting up credit cards and all these kinds of things, you're focusing on that to help balance your books. What do you think the transfer budget's going to be like for whomever's in charge at Manchester United, for Wilcox and Ashworth and or the new manager, if not, or, and or Ten Hag or the new manager? I don't know. I mean, with all of this stuff happening, with the front office stuff, Trimming jobs. I think it was like 20% of the folks were going to be viewed as redundant. Cutting up corporate credit cards, all those kinds of things. That doesn't sound to me like a team that is going to, uh, you know, really put the world on fire. All right. Um, it is time. It's uh, We're, we're going to punch the clock a little early. And there's nothing wrong with that. So uh, the beauty of soccer is in session is that we get to talk to folks. And we get to pull them out of, like, lunchroom duty, and we get to pull them out of class, and we get to sit there and, and see if uh, the coaches can sit there and, hey, I need you to sit in my class for a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm doing a show. And so we have one of these instances. And so since we are in a, a no-dilly, no-dally zone, and I don't want to get this guy into any trouble, I'm going to go to Athens, Georgia. And as a bit of a preview for soccer's in session, 
And, and the the beauty of doing a you know having a setup like this is I can see what Chris Aiken's up to, and Chris is trying to find a space inside Clark Central High School where he can sit down, perhaps not be heckled, and discuss what's going on with his football program, F-U-T-B-O-L. And it looks like he is in the indoor practice facility for American football, as he shows it to me, and I think he is. So we're going to bring Chris in to talk stuff. So you're in the football practice facility, huh? Yes, sir. This is our uh, this is our weight room here at Clark Central High School. The weight room. And so, yeah, I got to kind of see what was going on there. Uh, I saw that you were trying to find, were you getting heckled in your previous locations and that's why you ended no, up? So our, my, my other location is our, our wrestling room and it's a pretty yeah. dimly, dimly lit area. And so I was trying to find somewhere with a little better lighting for you. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, thanks for doing this. I know that, uh, you're taking some time here in a, in a planning period and a bit of a gap. Uh, it's game day. What is, uh, what is game day traditionally like, especially here in season three? What's it, what's it like getting ready for a match? Um, so game day begins, uh, have all the boys meet me uh, at school before the school day begins. Uh, today we had a Chick-fil-A waiting for them, bottled water. Um, for games, we wear the opposite jersey. We're not going to wear that game to school so that other students can see we have a game later today. Kind of a little cross promotion for the students. Uh, gives them a little bit of kind of self pride also and uh, lets them know throughout the day, kind of reminding them constantly they got a big game coming up. So I met with all the boys this morning for a little bit, gave them breakfast, got them a jersey. And uh, now we're just kind of moving through the school day, getting ready for the game. Top seed out of Region 8 in uh, Class 5A, and you are in one of the nastiest brackets around. You are low left as folks fill things out in pen. The final four in your bracket, Cross Keys at McIntosh <laughs> and Dalton coming to town today. You got when, – when the bracket came out, I know that coaches sit there and they'll kind of – figure out, okay, who's going on, who's going on. When did you have your bracket low left figured out? And what was your reaction of like, okay, we're in this with Dalton and McIntosh to, to get to a, uh, to a championship. Yes. Yeah, so, so we knew all the way back uh, about five weeks ago when we were playing Jefferson uh, for the region championship, what that result would do for us. Um, we knew winning that game would provide us the one seed, um, but it would match us up with Dalton and McIntosh. We already kind of did some foreshadowing all the way back in uh, early March to kind of see where we would end up and potentially wanted to end up and, uh, it came down to, obviously, we wanted to remain undefeated and beat Jefferson, so that wasn't really a question there. Uh, and we knew we'd match up with those two teams, um, but we thought having the home field advantage versus Dalton uh, would be pretty critical. Uh, we saw they lost to Cass early in the season, so we knew they'd finish as the two seed. Uh, but again, not having a ride in that two and a half hour bus ride, uh, which we've done to Peachtree City the past three years, uh, is something we were looking forward to avoiding. Um, so that was a good motivation to win that game, get the home field and host Dalton. And then again, yesterday morning, we found out we won the coin toss. So if we're able to come out tonight with a win, we'd get to host McIntosh and avoid the ride to Peachtree City as well. So um, we knew coming into the, to the game at Jefferson winning would, would get us those teams, but uh, you got to beat them sometime. So at least we get to host them both at, at Clark Central. So definitely tough, though, to know that the final four teams, like you mentioned, are number one in the state, number two in the state, number three in the state. So uh, <laughs> nothing easy coming up. If I had told you at this point of the season that you'd be 15-0-2, that you would have run right through the region and gone a perfect 6-0, and and that you would be looked at nationally ranked depending on your poll, your top 30 nationally, your top 15 in the state of Georgia depending on the poll, what would you have told me if I had just given you all that information at the beginning of the year? What would you have told me then? I knew coming in we'd be very strong. Uh, we returned a lot of players from last year that were key to our success. Um, we got 15 seniors in the program. They're all great leaders. Even the boys who don't get a lot of playing time are excellent leaders at practice, excellent leaders on game day. Uh, and so we knew we'd have a really solid season. Uh, obviously, you can never predict you'd go undefeated. Obviously, you never know how you're going to handle injuries, um, sicknesses, weather, things like that throughout the season. But uh, extremely proud of the way the boys have stepped in and handled different roles. Um, we came into the season changing some of our kind of tactical philosophies. We went from a much more defensive unit the past two seasons uh, to much more offensive heavy this year. Uh, we've relied heavily on kind of a 4-5-1, trying to keep every game 0-0 with great defense uh, and great goalie play. Uh, it's been very successful in the regular season, 2021-2022. Uh, both seasons we had, I think, 15-16 wins, but anytime we got down a goal, we struggled to chase the game. Uh, and that was because we spent so much time relying on defense throughout the regular season. And so coming into this year, knowing we returned Thad Pruitt and Raul, who were two of our leading goal scorers, as well as Lucas Stewart, uh, we knew we had some offensive power, power we could come into the season with, and we switched to a very kind of 4-3-3 with three forwards that stay high the whole game, trying to get the ball into more attacking positions quicker. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of success from that. I think we ended with a plus 80 goal differential this year. 
Um, and so definitely the offensive transition has been key to our success. We're kind of putting other teams on their heels, uh, getting up to zero, and then they're trying to chase us. And so uh, definitely the tactical shift to a much more offensive heavy formation uh, has been very successful this season. And we're looking to keep that going tonight. How difficult a transition was it for you to go from one formation to another, be comfortable with it, have the players be comfortable with it? Or has it still been a work in progress and they're still trying to sit there and they're still tweaking things as we get into season three? How long did it take to get to full song or are you still trying to get there? Still, still definitely tinkering constantly. Um, we started early in season with two holding mids throughout the first 10 games of the year because I was still focused on that defensive element. Um, but we had a player come back from an injury. He's a high caliber player, um, plays for the ODP regional pool team. Uh, he became the one true six. And so now we play with two cams uh, and even get more people forward. I think he was kind of a missing piece in that first part of the season as far as really wanting to free up the offensive versus defensive units. And so having the one holding six all game um, has provided us a lot of offense the past three games. We scored five versus Lithia Springs. We scored six versus Winder Barrow. And so he's kind of freed us up to get more players in the attacking third. Um, but again, like you mentioned, it's constantly just tinkering, seeing what's working, what's not working. Um, and seeing which players are playing well at the time, which are not playing well. We've got guys that come off the bench that come in and, and score consistently. And so everyone is constantly competing for those minutes in the attacking position. So uh, it's good to have a lot of people, um, not only the starting unit, but they're coming off the bench contributing. And so it uh, makes my job tough, but it's a good uh, problem to have. I was going to say, that's a good tough to have. Uh, Class 5A playoffs tonight. Clark Central hosting Dalton 14-4-1 against 15-0-2 in the toughest quadrant in 5A this year here in the GHSA playoffs, hanging out with us here, kind of breaking things down for a soccer is in session tease and preview for the show that's coming up at noon because Chris is kind of busy. You know, he's got he's got stuff to do there at Clark Central during the noon hour. So we figured we'd grab him here and talk about things. Dalton, how much film study have you done? Uh, is it just like we know what Matt Cheeves and the Catamounts are going to do. We've seen them. We, we know that this is his DNA. What has uh, what has uh, study hall been like getting ready for this matchup? Uh, so we're fortunate with the first round game uh, being seven days previous. We had a lot of time to prepare for them. Um, I was able to get a hold of five of their game videos. And so I've done a lot of video analysis. Um, high school soccer is no different than elite level soccer. When you're at the uh, top level of high school soccer, uh, you're doing as many things as you can to prepare for the game. So we've broken down film extensively, uh, dialed in on key players. We looked at 2023 statistics to see who was key players from last season. Uh, we're looking at who plays for what club teams, um, trying to identify tendencies on the field, see who leading goal scorers are, leading assist players. Uh, and so we've done extensive scouting. Um, we used practice last week on Thursday and Friday uh, to recover from Lithia Springs. And we got a hard practice on Friday. Um, but then these past two days, um, we've been doing a lot of kind of shadow play, walkthrough scenario based play on things that we've seen them do on film, uh, tendencies they have to try to kind of jump certain routes or get in front of certain plays before they develop. Uh, and then looking at trying to exploit some of their weaknesses um, that we might have seen on film. And hopefully uh, we can implement those tonight. It's interesting that you do shadows and walk through because you know, some folks will sit there and they'll go full speed or they'll go full speed and go stop, start. And it's like, OK, look at this, look at this, look at this. But you do it at a slower pace with walkthroughs and shadows. I find that really interesting. How'd you pick that idea up? Well, we, we kind of do it how you just mentioned with start stop. I, I actually am not a firm believer in the shadow play aspect of the whole training session. I think high school kids sometimes struggle to stay focused for a 60 to 90 minute session. If you're just talking and walking them through things, uh, and then you wonder how much they're actually comprehending and taking away. And so the way we design our training session is five minutes of maybe an intense passing pattern, and then we'll break it down and work on how to defend set pieces. And then we'll go back to a five minute passing pattern in a different variation. And then we'll go to five minutes of how they like to run a long throw and play. And then we'll go back to another seven to 10 minute segment of possession. And then we'll go back to defending them uh, from a goal kick. And so the practice is segmented into probably seven to eight different things that I'd like them to see that I saw on film. Uh, we code the film for them on huddle. And so they can watch what I'm talking about with timestamps and they've got, descriptions of what it's going to look like and then they have the visual representation but i also like to walk through it so i can say this is what i saw this is what i think it's going to look like obviously soccer is pretty free-flowing so you can't have it exactly how you want it to be and how they're exactly going to do it but you can give them a general idea of what they're going to do what it's going to look like how we want to defend it and so i do that for five minutes maybe seven total and then immediately go back to some type of soccer related activity so that they're moving they're back engaged in practice they're getting their blood flowing again and then we slow it down a second time and we just keep repeating that cycle so they're not staying around too much. They're engaged in practice, uh, and it lets them kind of just learn the key points of what I'm talking about, 
focus back on practice and then the next key point uh because if i just talk the whole time i don't know how much they would actually retain from my uh my my, my notes right uh in northeast georgia and i will i will go ahead and round off and call the athens area northeast georgia uh it is a growing soccer community slash hotbed because of what you're able to do what Oconee county is able to do and folks are having to pay attention to what's going on up there in northeast georgia when it comes to the on-campus and area support uh, i am of a certain vintage and i can remember uh, american football and billy henderson and i know american football and 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 uh, a guy named perno as a head coach and i know what american football means on that campus but what does football mean on that campus and what has the the fan support been like the student support been like as you have been able to to do all of these things on the field uh it's been it's been tremendous um i've been at clarkson for now 13 years um i love it here and i think it's a great soccer community like you mentioned i think it's definitely growing uh, our first round playoff game had a tremendous crowd um, for a wednesday school night uh, to see that many people come out we were very thankful uh, our last home game um we had teacher appreciation night. I think we had 35 teachers come out and they all brought their families and kids. And so uh, we've seen a, a lot of support from not only our own school, but people in the community. I know Cedar Shoals comes over and watches us play when we're at home, Oconee, North Oconee. Um, obviously, we're fierce rivals when we're playing each other, but uh, we're obviously supporting them. Um, Cedar's got a big game coming up. They made it to the Sweet 16 as well. And so we're cheering them on from afar. Um, and so, like you mentioned, it's very competitive in this area. Uh, we're probably not as well known um, like some of the bigger clubs down in Atlanta, GSA or Atlanta Fire, Concord, um, t programs that have a lot of MLS Next teams. Um, but we are fortunate to have Athens United, a Coney football club, and a lot of high kids that are playing at high-level soccer. Um, and so it's been very fortunate to have those kids come to our schools and help us produce good results at the high school level. And uh, the support from, like I said, teachers and students has been great, and we're hoping to get a big turnout tonight. I was going to say, since I know you have to get back to work, and thanks for taking the time to do this, cut the promo for me. Let everybody know the when, the where, and the who leading up to today. Uh, 7 o'clock tonight at home, Sweet 16. Uh, we get to host the defending 2023 state champs, and uh, we're looking forward to putting on a good game versus them. No doubt about it. Chris, thanks for taking time out of your hyper-busy schedule on a match day for hanging out with us, and uh, good luck tonight. It's going to be a tough one. You're in a tough region, but I know that uh, – You've got a lot of folks who are looking forward to this one across the board who appreciate the sport here in the state of Georgia. Good luck tonight. We'll catch up with you soon. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. There we go. Chris Aiken, the head coach at Clark Central. And so he is in their weight room. And he, he pulled time to go into the weight room, which is which was better lighted than, than the, uh, the initial spot. But uh, Chris Aiken kind of giving us a bit of a tease for uh, Soccer's in Session coming up at noon on the network. And it is uh, at noon. We're going to catch up, hopefully, with Philip Thomas, the head coach at River Ridge, and also Chris Leone as they are packing in their 7A matchup. Uh, they're hitting the road. And so uh, I get to pull Chris Leone, the head coach for uh, North Gwinnett, away from packing. And so uh, we'll see if uh, he is in a room or if he is going to be looking with the, the packing going on in the background. So we'll see what uh, Chris Leone has going on. But Philip Thomas at River Ridge at, at noon. And Chris Leone from North Gwinnett coming up at 1215 for Soccer's in Session Live, presented by our friends at uh, Kaiser Permanente. Uh, Kaiser Permanente for all that is you. North Gwinnett is going to be taking on Kennesaw Mountain today in the low right bracket in 7A. North Gwinnett came through as a four seed in round number one. They uh, knocked off the number one team in region 632, and now they travel to Kennesaw Mountain who won their 3-2 matchup, low right, 7A boys. And so we'll catch up with River Ridge. We'll catch up with North Gwinnett. We'll go through all the brackets and let you know what's going on today and get you ready for what's going on in day two, round two of the playoffs. Playoffs in uh, the sport of uh, soccer here in the state of Georgia. So very, very cool stuff going on. And once again, thanks to all of the coaches. And I mean, all these coaches that will sit there and they will – uh, take time out of their incredibly busy schedules. And like I said, I mean, and uh, Coach Aiken, by the way, is an assistant principal at Clark Central. So we pulled him away from not just coaching duties, but principaling duties. We pulled him from two different things. Got to, uh, got to hang out with him for about 10 minutes or so. So once again, that's your tease for Soccer's in Session coming up at uh, noon Eastern, and we'll let you know what else is going on in and around the planet when it comes to the activities of uh, soccer here in the state of Georgia. Uh, 
trying to see if there's any other news that I might have missed here this morning. Um, you now we have the, the stuff going on with Major League Soccer. Uh, West Ham, it looks like they're looking at Julian Lopetegui, possibly to take over for David Moyes. And it will be uh, interesting to see who it's uh, Ruben Amarim. I think they were looking at him. They're now looking at Lopetegui. And or you're trying to see what direction West Ham is going to go. And it looks like David Moyes' contract will not be renewed. Leicester beat Southampton. And uh, it looks like they are closing in on uh, promotion because, once again, you've got four teams that are close, three that are really close, Leicester, Ipswich, and Leeds. Only two of them get automatic promotion. The win over Southampton gave uh, the top three a bit of space with Southampton. Southampton looking like they're going to lock into the four in the championship. But once again, you look at the bottom half of the uh, – the table in the championship and literally for the two and because Rotherham's already been relegated. You look at the two positions on the board that are still uh, relegation spots for league one. You've got eight teams within, I think six points. So if you are really into the, the notion of uh, looking at relegation, six pointers and and, uh, the pro rel battle, then look at what's going on in the championship and follow them in, for uh, for their run in when it comes to uh, when when it comes to the the sport here in in England, so we've got that going on as well. Uh, like I said, I I am cruising and touring and seeing if there was any stories that I might have missed. And um, let's see, is it, uh, am I missing anything? Oh, uh, man, and United fans, since we're on United, by the way, it is. It looks like Eric Ten Hag branded the criticism of Manchester United's loss in the FA Cup semifinal as embarrassing and disgraceful. And it was a, a bit of a, a bit of a discussion. And Anthony was asked uh, about uh, all of the, uh, the jaw jacking back and forth and the, the lip flapping back and forth that was going on in the match. And, and it was between um uh, Coventry City players and Manchester United players. And Anthony was asked about it. He had a celebration. Um, he said that the celebrations after the win were uh, over Coventry were in defense of my club. Matt Jones at Eurosport. He defended his celebrations in the win. Uh, Anthony wheeled away cupping his ear, you know, th- this little bit in front of the Sky Blue players. Insists he was provoked while manager Eric Ten Hag admits that the player should not do it. And so uh, Anthony uh, justified his celebrations. He was criticized for doing this, and he insists he was provoked into such a reaction by an unnamed Coventry player. And so on the 280-character app, Anthony goes, Coventry proved why they reached the semifinal. We seeked, basically sought, this spot in the final for our fans, and we achieved the way our fans were treated by their player was not nice. And I, in the heat of the moment, I've reacted to the provocations in a natural defense of my club. So basically it was, they started it. They started it. Ten Hag asked about Anthony's celebration. Did you see the reaction of Harry Maguire? He was provoked. That's why this was a reaction to that. You haven't seen the provocation, only the reaction, but he should not do it. So Anthony basically goes, well, they started it, and so there you go. That's why he did it. I've also seen Harry Maguire. We should acknowledge the performance of Coventry. Game must be closed, but the return from their side was very good. So, yes, Anthony did what he did because they started it. They started it. But apparently, uh, fans are turning their backs on tickets. United messaged club members Monday afternoon telling them that more tickets had become available. For the Sheffield uh, United match on uh, Wednesday, due to the high number of tickets returned by season ticket holders. Negative reaction. The fact he was asked about it in his post-match press conference on Sunday, if he was embarrassed by the nature of United's collapse, was still eating at Ten Hog, who uh, lashed out at reporters yesterday at Carrington. Is it embarrassing? No, the reaction from you was embarrassing, as he pointed to the media. Top football's about results. We made it to a final. We deserved it, not only because of this game, but because of other games. We lost control for 20 minutes, but we also had bad luck. 
Made it to the final, which is a huge achievement, twice in two years. It's magnificent. For me as a manager, five cup finals in four years. The comments are a disgrace. Roy Keane, Jamie Carricker, they're all, they're all talking about it. Fans, they said that they were embarrassed. 3 p.m. on Tuesday, 500 tickets available for the Sheffield United match. Likely even more will return in the previous 48 hours. And Manchester United changes their ticket policy. They changed it two years ago. Penalizing season ticket holders who did not show up regularly for matches at Old Trafford. Now, if a fan doesn't show up to a certain number of matches, the club can remove the season ticket, period. Alternatively, if they don't plan to attend a match, according to the Times, season ticket holder can inform the club in advance, and they'll sell the seat to anyone who pays the $40 annual membership fee. The fact that this is a rearranged fixture, and it's also against Sheffield United, raises the the eyebrows about the whole thing. It's like, well, it's rearranged, and it's Sheffield United. I can understand why folks aren't interested. So uh, you're getting tickets returned. Ten Hag says we made it to a final. 60 separate cases of injury or illness resulting in a player missing a match this season. But, yeah, you're having folks returning tickets for a rescheduled Sheffield United match. And that really should not be a surprise. I mean, why would you? Why, if, if it's a midweek match, if it is a midweek match, and you have the chance, it was rearranged in the first place because of the FA Cup. It's against the last place team in the league. Would you want to go to would you want to go to friggin' Sheffield for the last for for a rearranged match in the midweek? Where you probably would still be penalized by the club because you didn't show up. Rah! I did not see the Neil Mope quote. I guess uh I did not see the Neil Mope quote, Del. Uh gossip rumor and in innuendo, innuendo what to watch. Arsenal Manchester City consider, considering a summer move for Bruno Guimaraes. Real Madrid and PSG also interested in signing him, who reportedly has a 100 million pound release clause in his contract at St. James Park. Liverpool will have to pay Feyenoord over a little over eight and a half million pounds in compensation if they want to make Arnest Slut their new manager. That's from the four letter paper. Take the information at your own peril. Oh, yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. We said that celebr- yeah, that celebration. And Neil Mope said, I wouldn't even do that. Yes, I did see that one. Uh, Bernardo Silva has decided to leave Manchester City. Release clause of 50 million, keen to make a switch to Barca. That's from Sport in Spain. Chelsea inquiring about RB Leipzig center back Castello Luqueba, who has a release clause of close to 60 million in his contract with the Bundesliga club. Manchester United are at least 13 million apart on Dan Ashworth. Talked about that. Thiago Silva has reached a verbal agreement with Fluminense since he's out of contract at the end of the year. That's from Goal. Arsenal Manchester United striker Robin Van Persie close to taking up his first managerial post after holding talks with Heronveen in the Dutch league. Real Madrid plan to extend the contract of Lucas Vasquez. Current deal runs out in June. PSG are in pursuit of Barcelona, 16-year-old prodigy Lamine Yamal. Keep an eye on that. Manchester United interested in Inter Milan defender Alessandro Bastoni and prepared to offer about 52 million pounds. Feyenoord also interested in Spurs' Brian Heal. Expected to leave in the summer. We mentioned Olivier Giroud. Going to join on a free. Signed through the end of 25. 18-month deal, and I think there's an option for another uh, another year. Manchester United interested in 17-year-old midfielder Severa Naipan, who has impressed at Rosenborg, four-letter paper. Bayern Munich set to reignite their interest in Frankie de Jong at Barca. Final two years of his deal coming up. AC Milan senior advisor Zlatan has told the club's owners to appoint Antwerp boss Mark Van Bommel as the Rossoneri's new head coach. So we'll see how much uh, we'll see how much uh, Zlatan has an impact with his uh, w- with his thought patterns. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, what to watch, where to watch it before we go. And once again, remember, soccer's in session coming up top of the next hour, noon Eastern time. We'll let you know what's going on in the playoffs here in the state of Georgia. 7 o'clock pregame, 7.33 kick. Atlanta United 2, Chattanooga FC on the network either on a soccer down here.mixler.com or on our Mixler app. Uh, Tampa Bay Sun made the first three signings in league history yesterday for the USL Super League. 
Erica Timrak, who won two uh, NWSL championships with uh, uh, with uh, FC Kansas City. Uh, also, you get uh, Canadian Jordan Listro and uh, Dominic Richardson, both midfielders. So three signings for Tampa Bay Sun yesterday as well. Uh, once again, what to watch on TV, where to watch it. If you're a true sicko, you want to watch a lot of stuff, you can watch it in obscure places by going to Fanatis and subscribing there. Jason got me hooked. I blame him. FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. And you can get all of the places like Teise, BN, all the BNs. Uh, for the fans, Nuestra Tele, Gold TV, Liga One Max, all of them. You can get it at Fanatis and really go down the rabbit hole, especially in uh, uh, Central and South America, South America and Europe, specifically Middle East and North Africa as well. So that you can do at Fanatis. What's on Fanatis, you say? Well, BN and BN and Espanol have League on doubleheader and a Copa Libertadores doubleheader one and three and six and eight Eastern. CBS Sports Network, Copa Italia, Atalanta, and Fiorentina is at three. The CONCACAF Hemispheric Extravaganza is at eight on FS1 with Crew and Monterey. USA Network simulcast has uh, Crystal Palace and Newcastle at three. Also on the board, two to NA is your simulcast for Crew and Monterey. The Zone USA has the French Division One with PSG and Paris FC. Belgian Pro League playoffs on the plus at 230. It is both Bruges taking on Gink and Anderlecht. And the Air Divisie has Ajax and Excelsior. Uh, MLSNextPro.com, if you're not in Kennesaw, has the twos in Chattanooga FC at 730. There is no local radio option yet. Paramount Plus, Asian Champions League is already completed with Yokohama Marinos and Ulsan. They're also simulcasting the Copa Italia. Peacock has all three matches uh, in the uh, Premier League that is not that are not going to be aired uh, on uh, the uh, over the air television. So it's a, once again a very very busy day in England, and we will run the juice boxes really quickly here uh, in the Prem. Two forty five, Bournemouth a slight favorite at the Molyneux against Wolves at a plus one forty seven. Newcastle favored at, at uh, Selhurst Park against Crystal Palace at a plus 127. Everton, a big underdog at home against Liverpool at a minus 238. Manchester United and Sheffield United. Manchester United is a minus 286. Sheffield United is a plus 713 in the composite, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. Right now, once again, Manchester City, two matches in hand. They are down four points to uh, Arsenal. Arsenal's at 77 points. They have four matches to go. Liverpool a match in hand. They are at 74 points, but they are well behind in goal difference. Manchester City, third at 73. Villa has four matches to go there at 66 points. That's group number one. Tottenham kind of in a world of their own. They are at 60 points. Newcastle and starting group number two or 2B. Uh, Newcastle, Manchester United, 50 points. West Ham at 48. They've lost three of five. They only have four points in their last five matches. Chelsea's at 47 points. They've won two and drawn two in their last four. Brighton at 44 points, having to juggle uh, international competitions this season. First time they've ever had to do that. They have six matches to go, and they are in 10th. Wolves are in 11th at 43. Fulham ahead of Bournemouth on goal difference at 42 points by eight. That gets us to 14th. Crystal Palace with uh, five matches to go, 36 points. Brentford, four matches to go, 35 points. They should be okay. Everton, 30 points, still waiting on another review. At the end of the season, they are at, they are 16th at 30 points. Nottingham Forest, who've gone full heel with all of their responses to everything, 26 points, waiting on possibly another point deduction. Relegation zone got really tight. Luton now at 25. They've lost four of five. Not the time to do that. They have four matches to go. Burnley, 23 points, three points from safety. They have four matches to go. They've only lost once in their last five, but they have three draws. Sheffield United's won three of 33. They have 16 points. They've lost three of five. So that's where we are in the Premier League, and that's where we are with your viewing habits, and that's where we are with all of the stuff. Once again, remember, noon Eastern, soccer's in session live. And it is Cassie <laughs> close. It's close to a three hour show. If you want to talk about the break and then add soccer's in session, it's three hours of content from nine to one with an hour gap or more like a 50 minute gap at this point. Uh, Cassie, as always, thank you. And thanks to everybody on the Twitch pitch this morning. Yep. Dell, I benched Holland, but because Cole Palmer did not play, that's why I said when we were talking about fantasy that I was covered, 
I've got Phil Foden. So Foden's points will take care of Cole Palmer's points. I think that's how that works. And uh, if you have not joined the Fantasy League here with us at SDH, go to the Jason Wright Agency on Facebook, Wright with a W, or go to Jason Wright with a W A G E N on Twitter, and you can join the Fantasy League. And besides, yeah, yeah, I know it's match week 10 or 11, but still, you come in, you have fun, you're a part of the league, and you can run smack on everybody all season long. So back at noon Eastern, and we'll catch up with folks, uh, get you ready for day two, round two of the playoffs in the GHSA and presented by our friends at Kaiser Permanente Soccer is in session coming up at noon Eastern. For all of you out there, from all of us here, thanks for hanging out with us. That's uh, Wall Pass Wednesday. Thanks to Tyler. Thanks to uh, Chris Aiken at, at uh, Clark Central to give us a bit of a tease. And because it's the end of the show, that means I get to do this. Mucha Plati, I'll play it safe. We'll see you at noon Eastern for Soccer's in Session Live, playoff style.